How to be mentally strong and fearless. Interview with Dr. Karen Dog. Are you struggling with stress and feel that you are the only one? Are there some practical interventions that can help you be mentally strong and fearless despite all the stress that you may be facing in life? Then you're in the right place. Our guest today is going to share some some of the most effective stress management techniques that you can apply in your life right away. So let's learn from her. You are watching Happy and Healthy Mind program, episode 123. And our guest today, Dr. Karen Dahl, is a licensed psychologist, consultant, and the best-selling author. In her international best-selling book, Building Psychological Fitness, she explains how high-performing achievers achieve success with ease. She's also a newly appointed chairwoman of the Howard University Flourishing at Work Network. She provides online programs to high achieving professionals and also speaks at organizations on workplace mental health. And I'm your host, Dr. Rosina Lakani. I'm a psychiatrist, author, and speaker. I help women leaders reverse burnout using their own genetic code. I also help other people overcome depression, anxiety, and burnout, and optimize mental wellness with precision medicine. I believe that our mind is the software that runs the hardware of both our brain and the body. Therefore, I share practical tips for your mental fitness. If you need specific medical advice, please consult your healthcare professional. But if you find this content helpful, then join our mission of eradicating preventable suffering by liking, subscribing, and sharing so more people can live their life and perform at their best with hope, health, and happiness. All right, so let's jump in. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Karen, for joining us today. Tell us, how did this topic become important in your life? Good morning, Dr. Rosina. Thank you so much for having me. So I've been a psychologist for 25 plus years. And so mental health awareness and and addressing mental health in the workplace has always been a passion of mine. I would say in in the more recent years, I've I've been able to call it that. and, And people have been a little more open to talking about mental health at work. And so this idea of building psychological fitness, which is the the book that I published last year, um, how that came to be really was this energy that I had during COVID when I was coaching people. I would have back-to-back coaching sessions and hearing meeting after meeting how people were really struggling and feeling so isolated. And what made me sad or made me create, had get some like energy around what to do about this is that people were feeling like they're the only one struggling. And it's very easy to slip into assuming that everyone else has this thing figured out or everyone else is thriving and flourishing. And why am I the only one? And so, you know, it occurred to me, I'm having conversations like this with people every day, and yet they're not talking with each other enough. So, so that was kind of how my, my book, project came to be is I wanted to get information out there to promote mental health awareness, but also just to offer some interventions and practices and strategies that are backed by science, but they're accessible and can apply to anybody. And really wanting to reinforce the idea that we we can have agency over our mental health and to just remind people that, you know, whatever your struggle is, whatever your internal challenge is, you are never the only one. So true, so true. And like I, you know, psychiatrist around the same time, 26 years. And yeah, I saw the same thing. Like, you know, people go over and over, like, you know, same stories repeated in terms of how stress impacts their ability to function, their mental health. And COVID made it so much more pronounced you know, mm-hmm. because the isolation kind of added to difficulties. So can you share an example of somebody that you helped and how these techniques helped them? Absolutely. So I work with a lot of high achieving professionals, which I'm sure makes up the majority of your audience because that is who's showing up to learn and, and listen in on, on podcasts and, and educational material. I would say a very 
common presenting challenge. I work with a lot of female professionals too, and women who come to coaching really with this challenge of kind of the impossibility of managing it all and the expectations that they have for themselves causing a lot of unnecessary distress. So, um, you know, a common, I can think of a numerous recent examples of women coming and feeling like they're not enough. They feel like they're, they're stretched, they're pulled in all kinds of different directions and they're not showing up as the leaders they want. They're not showing up as the parent they wanna be at home. And they're in a perpetual state of compromising themselves often in order to meet the needs of others. And, you know, often I think females have that conditioning of being other centered and that can get us into the trap of over committing and over performing and that takes a toll. So when people come to coaching, often they're at that, that place where it's been kind of a slow burn and they're feeling depleted, they're feeling not as effective and they're feeling stressed out that they're not doing fill in the blank as well as they think they should be doing. Or they used to be able to do. Yes, yes. As their ability starts kind of going down or they keep on going on and on. They feel like they really need to take a break. But, you know, the life, like I call, call it like the web of my own creation. <laughs> the one time when I was feeling that way right? and I was reflecting, I said, I feel like stuck in the web of my own creation. Like, how do I get out? And I feel like, you know, I want to help more people and I want to do all these things in life. And, and yet if I don't take care of myself, I'm going to totally burn out. And so a lot of, a lot of women go through that. So using an example, can you share somebody whom you helped who was at the risk like that or feeling that way? And how did their life change after they applied some of the tools that you're going to teach us today? Sure. Yes, I, I love your term, the web of your own creation. That's that's quite resonant. And I, you know, I also, and I'm happy to to talk through some examples. I also think it's important to note that sometimes these people are very high performing and they're still doing well, yet it is coming at a cost. So they may be high performers, yet perhaps they're experiencing burnout or fatigue or chronic stress and their own well-being and or mental and physical health are suffering as a result of. So I would say, you know, with with many people that that come to coaching with this, we start to think about what are some top down strategies and practices that we can do and what are some bottom up strategies and practices to manage stress. And really, I just try to meet people where they are. And I'll, I'll use one example, or I, I would say it's a common example of under getting women, getting a client to understand what are, are, what are the actual expectations and what are what I call phantom expectations. So, you know, how we see things, we see things as we are, not as they are. And so upgrading our mental models and our thinking patterns can be really useful to help right size our interpretation and our response to circumstances and, and adversity. So if I think of a common client who struggles with the shoulds, I should be working out more. I should be showing up like this. I should be doing that. That generates a lot of unnecessary distress and guilt and guilt is heavy and self-persecutory. So helping people understand, you know, what are the actual expectations and then what maybe are the thinking traps that I'm exacerbating in my head? Do I actually need to respond to this email today? Sometimes we do, you know, sometimes those are real expectations. This is what my boss is, is, is needing from me today. But often we've created arbitrary, unrealistic expectations that are fueling some of those thinking traps and some of that negative thinking. Part of the, the process of cognitive reframing is kind of climbing down the ladder of assumptions, creating some healthy detachment and a little bit of space between the situation, what is my thinking, how am I feeling about this, and then challenging like what, what's another way of looking at this, what's actual, what's factual, and then what am I kind of stirring up based on my own internal thoughts and feelings? That's a wonderful, you know, cognitive behavior therapy mm -hmm. approach that we talk about. And I think we can go a little bit further in detail of in terms of if somebody wants to apply 
Let's kind of use an example. Let's kind of use my example, and I can be your guinea pig and kind of help me through a difficult situation. So let's see, I'm kind of trying to do three programs at this time, and I'm kind of feeling overwhelmed in terms of how to do this, how to do this, how to do this. Mm -hmm. And so my mind is going really uh, all the time. And I noticed that even when I woke up in the morning, my mind was kind of going through, okay, I had to do this, I had to do this. Oh, I also had to do this. Well, I can't do everything like today. So how am I going to plan it out? And my mind is constantly thinking about what to do, how to get all those urgent, important things taken care of without feeling overwhelmed and burnt out. So help me, what can I do? Walk me through some of these steps. Sure, well, I think that, that that's a common sentiment. There's, there's so much to do, so many things, not enough time. And then that can, you know, fuel some of those thinking traps. So I would encourage you, us to zoom in and look at what's the immediate, what is the immediate challenge? What is the most important thing for me to focus on right now? What is in my realm of control? and what is outside my realm of control, and then let that set the stage for how we tackle the thing. Let's say I do that, well, I do that. <laughs> and yeah. so I try to say, okay, this is something, I use a Kanban method that we talked about in one of our other previous programs, how to prioritize things and everything is a priority. And uh, sometimes you are in that trap where you feel like everything is a priority. So yeah, I have to do some presentation preparation, I have to do some course, I have to finish my CME with the deadline. So I have like several things that are all very, very important. And so I did ask what is important and all of these things are important for me in terms of the immediate. Your question was, what is the immediate need? And so immediate need could be something that may not be that important. So why don't you ask me the specific questions and I can answer so that listeners can actually go through that process step by step. Okay, great. Yeah, when we're, when we're feeling overwhelmed, I think it's really important to just zoom in concretely, zoom in to what is real and happening right now. So today, right now, in the immediate, what feels like the most important thing that needs your time and attention? self-care <laughs> i'm feeling tired and yeah. i'm feeling a little exhausted and i feel that i need to relax because my body is getting tight and and tired i love the precision of your response you're listening to the whispers <laughs> and i love the tone of self-compassion and, and recognizing, you know, what your needs are right now. So you're noticing that you're feeling, you're feeling, beginning to feel tight and you need to relax. What typically helps you relax? Relaxing tub bath, mm -hmm. going for a walk, talking to a friend, watching some mindless comedy. Love that too. Sleep. Okay, those are all fantastic micro interventions and what feels accessible to you now as an option? Well, at this point in time, I can potentially go sit outside and look at some trees and how the leaves are kind of changing into fall colors and maybe enjoy that. I think that may help me relax and then do a little mindfulness exercise and it's like my body feels tight, even though I know and I teach, sometimes I also get tight and I kind of need to do this intentional letting go or sometimes go for a massage to get rid of this built up tension in my body. So that sounds fantastic. And so what's probably what's happening right now is we're both activated, right? So our nervous system is a little bit activated, even if we're not incredibly stressed out in this conversation, we're still needing to be on. And if you already have a little bit of like underlying tension or underlying pressure in your body, 
that is the the fastest acting way is to foster calm and hit pause and generate some cultivate calm and generate some relaxation to help get back to center so okay so i relaxed uh what what do i do after relaxing because all the demands are still there all the projects still need to do to to happen my mind is still kind of all over in terms of all these things have to be done Okay, so let's look at the thinking. What are what are the thoughts that you're having? All of these things need to be done. Yes. What else? What can I do? I just feel like, you know, if I'm in my form, like I'm if I'm in my best form, then I'm active, I can kind of do things faster, I can be more efficient, I can be more focused. But when I'm exhausted like this, it is hard for me to focus. It's hard for me to like, you know, something that I usually do in half an hour is taking me one hour or, or longer. So things yeah. are kind of stretching when I am exhausted like this. And certainly that is human limitation, right? If when, when we're compromised, we're not going to be at our, our best self. So if we look at how to modify, upgrade some of the thinking here, all these things need to be done. So having that thought produces what kinds of feelings? Overwhelm. Yes. What else? Sense of failure or that I'm not good enough mm -hmm. or I am like imposter. I feel like I'm an imposter. I'm trying to say, prove that all these things and prove in all my roles and maybe I'm not good enough to be able to do all these things. Okay. So this is the inner critic voice that's producing these thoughts and these unpleasant emotions. Correct. Okay. So let's go back. Let's like, let's climb down the ladder of assumptions. Let's go back and look at what's actual and what's factual. All of these things need to be done. It feels like all these things need to be done. Correct. So, so let's put that thought on trial and, and understand maybe there's a, what's another way of looking at this. What's another thought about your situation that might feel more generative? All these things need to be done, but they don't have to be done today. I can space it out. Okay. Good. What else? I would like to get all these things done. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. I would like to I would like to compartmentalize. I would like to like the the thought that I was thinking about was, you know how when you go to school, there are like so many subjects that and each subject has the homework to be done or the or the project to be completed or whatever. And so if I can think about these projects as okay, subjects and then maybe divvy up the time. Okay, this is the time I do these and this is the time I do this, maybe I would feel less stressed about doing everything. Okay. So it may be helpful if I break things down into doable separate components. Right. Okay. So let's let's challenge the all the things need to be done again. And so all the things need to be done according to what? According to my own expectations. <laughs> okay. And, and and similarly, you know, according to who? According to me. Okay. And, and what's the metric? I don't understand. What do you mean? So the, if all these things need to be done according to, to me, that sounds like what, is that an actual expectation? Is that a self-imposed expectation? Is that a reasonable expectation? And what are even all the things? Yeah. So I guess I can just say five things need to be done or I would like to do these five things over next week. Okay. Instead of all the things. I think that would make it easier. Okay. Count, you know, it would be finite number of things rather than, and it could be 50 things and maybe I can choose five things for today. And, you know, other, other things could be done next week or next week or kind of spread out. So all things don't need to be done, actually, yeah. <laughs> Five things need to be done. <laughs>
but okay so so now we're we're beginning to right size the thinking to to match the demand at hand and you know when we find ourselves having that you know according to me according to my own standard i think that's it's useful to challenge that because because what often happens is when we're setting that internal expectation it's it's sort of arbitrary and very often, if we look at it more carefully, you know, what what often happens is that goalpost just moves. Right. Yeah. Never good enough. Then you're never good enough because when you achieve one thing, then there's another one. And then, then when you achieve yeah. that, then there's another one. And how much is enough? Right. Usually that we're, we end up remaining in that space uh, mentally of it's never quite enough. We never got quite enough done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is very helpful and I think we can continue to go on, but I'm aware of our time. So let's kind of wrap up for our audience in terms of how they can apply this technique that you just applied on me, help me think through my own mental traps. And, you know, I just want to kind of acknowledge that despite us being in the profession and teaching other people, sometimes we ourselves get in these traps. And so we need to apply these tools in our life regularly. And sometimes I joke in my, you know, when I'm teaching teaching people or giving talks, I say, okay, I teach this so that my brain can hear. <laughs> and Absolutely. I apply these things in my life. So, Every day. That's why we, we call it me search. <laughs> <laughs> Just to circle back, to circle back, to kind of close the loop on that little exercise. So I could do the, I could complete these five things this week. How does that feel compared to where we started, which is I need all these things to be done? It feels doable. Mm -hmm. It feels less overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It still feels a lot because those five things are kind of major things. Yes. But I feel like, you know, I can do it rather than, oh my God, it is just too much. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah. So we can, if we unhook just a little bit from the intensity or the unpleasantness or the distress that's associated, it still might be a challenge. It still might be a little unpleasant, but if we can move the needle to reduce some of the pain, I think that's progress. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And we can kind of continue to work on it further and further. And as I said, like, if you can just get better 1% every day, then you keep on building up on it. Compound, Im compound impact, small steps for compound impact. Yes, yes, Love definitely. That. And so can you kind of give us your best advice to people who are listening today if they are going through these feelings of overwhelm and stress how can they become mentally strong and, and overcome the fear, become fearless, as we said, or courageous to deal with all the all the demands in their life and, and take a stand so that they can get their grounds back? Because, you know, if they are high achievers, they have done this multiple times in their life in terms of finding a challenge, facing the challenge, overcoming the challenge. Now, feeling of overwhelm is a challenge or stress. Mm -hmm. How do they overcome? And if you can give us that, your best advice for that. Well, my headline for that, my best advice headline is if you are struggling, ask for help. Because sometimes just being heard and having people accompany us relieves the distress a little bit and be a reacher outer and offer to help. Like we can crowdsource some of this. And in terms of the mentally strong, these are all resilience practices that over time, it's like building building your cognitive muscles and training some of these upgrade in your mindset, cognitive reframing, challenges, challenging your thinking. Over time, that can become more of the default mode rather than defaulting to the catastrophizing or the, the less healthy thinking traps. And so doing the work bit by bit and just continuing to come back to center, the triggers and the anxiety and the stress isn't going to go away, but we can upgrade our relationship with it. So that was more than one thing. <laughs> but it's all kind of ties in together, right? It ties in together. People say, oh, reprogram your brain or like, you know, rewire your brain. How do you do that? You do that 
by doing one step at a time, modifying one thought at a time, and kind of, I think, I think what what really helped in all, all this discussion, you know, personally was in this moment, what is the most important thing, mm-hmm. and and challenging the thought: Do I really have to do all the things? What is the most important thing? immediate thing that I had to take care of and then taking that that taking that break or just thinking about what I can do to to relax myself and decrease that body tension so I can perform what I want to do in the best possible way was very helpful. So thank you so much. And doing it together is better. We are all on this journey together. Yeah. And sometimes you can and many times you know people who are high achiever or especially women in leadership, they feel like they cannot talk to even their colleagues or, you know, the friends because then they may be seen as weak or they're having some difficulty. So they kind of really have to create, they feel, they don't have to, but they feel that they have to create this mask and then keep it all their feeling to themselves and they don't want to feel vulnerable. And so when you say, ask for help. It could be ask for help from your friends or family or then neutral professionals like you and me so that we can help them before they totally burn out, before they really sick, get sick. And so let, let's kind of share with the audience if they want to learn more about you and your work, how can they reach you? Yeah, great. And I just wanted to build on the last thing that you said about you know being mentally strong being courageous is being vulnerable. It isn't, it isn't either or. It, it takes, it's like doing it with the fear, taking the action with the fear and having the courage to speak up and, and ask for help. So I think that's, thank you for, for looping that in. It's a really important and impactful point. You can find me at drkarendoll, D-R-K-A-R-E-N-D-O-L-L.com. And I'm on, I'm on LinkedIn. And my book is Building Psychological Fitness. And I have a lot of practical tools and cognitive reframing PDFs and guides that are QR coded in my book. Wonderful, wonderful. And thank you so much for sharing your gift with our audience. So if you're listening and you would like to get Dr. Dahl's Psychological Fitness Action Plan, she has shared a PDF with us, which you'll be able to find on our website happyandhealthymind.com resources. So please go ahead and check it out and that start building your mental resilience and become mentally stronger. And so let me leave you with this question. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. What do you choose today? Are you going to let life make you flow in the same way that you have been? Or are you going to take a courageous step today? Take one moment to look at how your mind is thinking and take one step towards challenging that thought and finding a more helpful thought instead of hurtful thought. And try to work on this 1% improvement today. Choice is yours, it's your life, you decide. But just showing up today here is courageous. And so you've taken the step, now apply those tools that you've learned. Stay safe, happy, and healthy until next time. Dr. Rosina, and thank you, Dr. Tom. Thank you.